Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. Okay, on the show today, Rosie Sexton. So Rosie is completely average in that she has a PhD in maths from Cambridge, was a UFC cage fighter in mixed martial arts, long history of jiu-jitsu and martial arts. Uh, is currently a counsellor, so that's a type of politician, for those who don't know the UK, for the Green Party, and is currently contesting the Green Party leadership. So, um, you know, this Rosie, you've, you've just had an average, boring life, clearly, haven't you? Yes, I, I keep sort of accidentally saying yes to things and uh, sort of getting um, <laughs> sucked up in, in, in interesting projects. But, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I've known you for a few, well, maybe nearly 10 years now as a sort of friend and Facebook friend and you've been to all my courses and stuff, but it's sort of fairly overachiever there, huh? I mean, it's not just you studied maths, it was a PhD from Cambridge. I tend to, when when I do something, it tends to become sort of an area of hyper-focus and I I just do that. Get really good at that. Yeah, um, and I do that for about a decade and then I sort of move on to something else. That's enough time um, to get good at something. Yeah, yeah, um, so I did maths for a bit and then I got involved in mixed martial arts and I I, I went off and I had a 12-year professional fight career. Then I retired from that. And I'm running my osteopathy clinic, and then I got involved in politics. Wow. Okay, so we'll start with the sort of embodied stuff. Actually, you know, remind me of a little bit. The only person I think is even remotely comparable is, is it Josh Watkins, who wrote the book? He was a, a grandmaster at chess and then, and then started doing um, uh, martial arts, and he wrote a book about learning. So you must be very good at learning to have got good at all these things. Yes, I think there's, there's something about doing... Um, a number of different things at a high level because you start to see all the parallels and the crossovers. Um, it's, I think it's easier to, once you've got good at one thing, yeah. it's easier to apply those lessons to something else. Let's start there. Let's start with the general, then let's go back to your life story. So you got good at a number of things that are very different or seemingly different. What, were the, what was the generalizable, because this is the uber skill, because if you learn about learning, you can learn about anything quicker. So what are the, what's the generalizable skills about getting good at anything? I think I was talking to my piano teacher about this recently, actually. I think one of the things that comes in really handy, it's not something that gets talked about a lot, is being able to identify where your limiting factors are, where, where the pinch point is in the process. You know, what's, what's stopping you from being better at that? And being able to identify where that is and then figure out how to how to train it, how to develop that very specific thing and, and then put that back into the hole again. So, I mean, for example, with playing the piano, it might be... Um, oh, you're, you're learning the piano as well right now because you're not busy being a politician. So you just well, I, I, I played the piano a lot when I was growing up and then I had sort of 20 years off when I didn't really play it very much. Um, in the last few years, I've got back to it. As well, so I'll I've be a concert pianist in ten years. I know you will. I'll turn on the TV. Um, there you'll be. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's more something I, I, don't, I mean, I don't get enough time to practice, but it's more something that I, I just enjoy doing. Um, and uh, you said a key thing there. If I can jump in, Rosie, that most people don't want to focus on what's hard for them. Mm. But it seems like part of your success has been going. Okay, what's the sticking point? Let's go there. Yeah, yeah. Give an example of that, like from MMA or from anything at all. Like, what, what would be an example of that? I mean, so in mixed martial arts, for example, uh, I mean, these days, to be good at mixed martial arts, you have to be able to do a bit of everything. So you have to be good at striking, you have to be good at wrestling, you have to be good at fighting on the ground. So, I mean, the first thing is sort of identifying, right, where am I strong, where am I less strong? And, uh, you know, if if your striking is weaker than your grappling, for example, it's it's sort of saying, right, I need to spend a bit more time on that. But it's more specific than that as well. It's sort of saying, well, actually within that area of things, what do I do well and what do I do badly? And why the stuff that's not working well, why is it not working well? And is it because there's... Um, a physical attributes or a lack of physical attributes so because no. I'm not strong enough or I'm not fast enough is it because of sort of reaction time you know am I not reacting fast enough to what the person's doing is it that I've got some bad habits that I need to get out of and sort of being able to identify right this is what's happening 
and then saying, right, now how do I go away and how do I improve that? Um, because I think, again, mixed martial arts is a really good example and it's a really good training ground for doing this because... Well, that's a polymath can... art in itself as well, right? People yeah. you know, say it's got lots of different things within it. Sorry yes. to interrupt you there, Rosie. And I think what you tend to find is that um, yeah, you, you, it's sort of easy to say, right, this isn't working very well, but being able to find out why it's not working and then say, right, this is how I'm going to get better at it. Because when you break it down, you, I mean, you, can, you can train a particular technique and you can you know, do a, a few hundred reps of that technique. But then when you put it back into a situation under pressure, yeah. Being able to then make it work in that in that environment when you're when you're under pressure, you know, when the the heat is on, that's a whole different thing. So the question then becomes, how do I get from being able to do it when I'm just going through the motions, working the yeah. technique? Yeah. How do I escalate from there to being able to do it in a fight when somebody's trying to knock me out? Yeah, we and, to Nick Winkleman about this yesterday, who's one of the heads of Irish rugby kind of sports mm. science, and uh, wrote a book on learning and and the body. And it's 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 say this, and this also applies in terms of just people who are doing yoga. How do they get that into their life? Mm. Right, so there's the pressure yeah. testing of a fight, but also yeah. the pressure of life. Like, okay, you're great at that breathing technique, but can you do it when your kids are screaming? Yes. Kind of thing. Yeah, oh, mum. I mean, this is something I, I talk. Mum as well, right? Add mum to yeah. the list. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, this is something I talk to some of my patients about um, when I'm, if they come and see me, I've got a lot of patients who have sort of neck and shoulder pain that's related to tension, that's related to breathing patterns. Uh -huh. So I'll sometimes be talking to them about, about breathing patterns and, and we'll start with something very easy. So they're, they're just able to think about the breathing. They don't have to think about anything else. Uh, but what I always say to them is as soon as you stop thinking about it, you'll go back to doing what you always do. Right. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. posture. Posture is another good example because you Habits. know yeah. people are sort of uh, sat at the computer a, a lot of the time. Uh, they'll sort of creep into certain postures. When they think about it, you know, they'll they'll bring their shoulders back. They'll sit up straight. Um, and but as soon as they stop thinking about it, they'll end up back where they started. Yeah. So it's a question of right, how do you get from there to being able to do this more consistently? And that process is. Again, I, th I think that's where a lot of the art is. That's where a lot of the sticking point is in getting, um, getting good at something and make, being able to train in a way that becomes relevant to what you're actually doing. Yeah, making it relevant. Because it's one thing I'm taking notes by on my phone. One of the things that's... Um you learn an abstract skill, but how do you make it relevant for an yes. intense situation like a fight um, yeah. or a, an interview on your politics from an, you know, on channel yeah. four or something, um, you know, channel four interviewer, that's, that's a cage fight. Um, or, uh, you know, being a mum and you know, you're tired and your kid's screaming again. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, uh, I think that in itself is a, is a skill set that's really useful to learn. Um, and it's, it's one that doesn't get talked about a lot. I think it's it's something that people because I'm, I, so I will, I'll go to sort of seminars and workshops and things like that and sometimes you know for mixed martial arts again for an example you you can go to a seminar and they'll show you a bunch of different techniques yeah and yeah. You go away going oh there's some really cool techniques there yeah but then a week later or two weeks later how many of them are you actually using you know, I must have been shown, I did a year of MMA, but fairly intensely, but just a year. And I, I must have been shown 300 techniques in that time. But in sparring, yeah. even a sort of intense, you know, more yeah. like competition prep sparring, I must have used five. Yes. You know, it was like I got good at a guillotine, for example. I got good at an arm bar, you know, like basic things. And yeah. that was what I actually did because the rest, yeah. and we essentially have wasted yeah. Well, I probably wasted 80% of my training, technical training time, not yeah. fitness training time. It's hard to waste fitness training time, but I wasted 80% of that technical training time on stuff that never transferred into my game. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Again, you, if you do studies of judo players, um, I think this has been done, and uh, looking at how many different techniques a typical world-class judo player yeah. would use, it's a very small number. Yeah, yeah, most of them yeah. win with one technique repeatedly and may That's have a backup one. What they have is one or two techniques that they can put together, but they can do it from anywhere. Yeah. And they can tell you that that's what they're going to do to you and they'll still do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're, they're, they're that good at it and knowing all the ins and outs and how to get into that, how to get out of it, you know, what the counters to all the counters are, all of those things. So I think this is something that people 
again misunderstand they think that getting good at something is about learning lots of different techniques or about yeah. having lots of different ways to do things and actually a lot of the time it's not it's about having one or two that you can really make work for you and understanding how those fit together and what to do um, what the normal obstacles are how to overcome those and all of those things so it's sort of starting from where you are and kind of building that building your game plan and your strategy around what works for you nice nice okay let's go a bit back into your life things so i always like to keep these interviews personal so you grew up where so i moved around a lot so i was born in france uh, my parents were there at the time my dad was working overseas and we moved back i was probably about six months old when we moved back to solihull in fact um it's amazing. i yes so i learned to learn to walk um not far from where i am at the moment um we were there for a few years so we moved to bedfordshire uh, and then when i was about eight or nine we moved to crowthorne in berkshire okay so british parts of britain yeah yeah. They, we use, I guess, we're sort of geeky and bright at school. Got into mathematics. This is maybe. The yeah. First. So I was, I, I was your stereotypical nerd, really. Uh, when I was at school, I was, yeah, very sort of bookish. Um, yeah, I, 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 maths and science were, were maths and science. Bit of a geek, and followed. Yeah. You know, went to university, followed that through conclusion, PhD at Cambridge. What's that like? Yeah, it was in Manchester, actually. I did my, my degree at Cambridge, then I oh. moved to Manchester, and I did my PhD there. PhD. Okay, the other way around. Sorry, I thought it was the other way around. Okay, so you've done your PhD. I mean, you've done maths to a, you know, a high level. The only person I know connecting embodiment to maths is Adam Barley, who's just done this wonderful thing on uh, maths and dance, which I highly recommend people take a look oh, at. Wow. Excellent. Uh, well worth a look. But it tends to be something that you don't get many maths people who are super body people. And then they're very abstract and they're very physical. Mm. Yes. Mm. I think... And that's probably one of the reasons that I wanted to sort of expand and do something else for a bit. I think when I'd, uh, I, I, I love maths. I love um, the, that problem solving element of it, getting lost in a, in a mm. puzzle, basically. And that's something that really appealed to me and I really enjoyed doing it. But what I tend to find is that if I just do that, there's a whole section of sort of my personality and uh, I do that isn't getting fed. Listen, I'm with you. I'm the guy who likes everything, right? That's why the embodiment conference has so much in it. Cause I'm the, I'm the generalist. I'm the guy who loves everything. You know, I've done a bit of dance, a bit of therapy, a bit of this, a bit of that. What got you into martial arts then? Like at what point does a maths geek doing a PhD goes, you know what I really want to do? I want to choke some motherfuckers out. Like how, how does that happen? Well, I actually got into martial arts when I was, when I was a teenager. So I think it was when I was about 14 and mm. it was the really common path to getting into martial arts. I wanted to learn a bit of self-defense. So mm-hmm. thinking was, well, if I get attacked in a dark alleyway, you're quite big any idea as well, what right? Like you was, when I first met you, you're surprisingly small. Though when you choked me out for fun once in the market, which I can still remember quite tra- traumatically, you've got it. Yeah, I remember that, that being quite surprised such a small person can exert so much force. But because uh, you're, you're quite petite, you're thinking, I want to learn a bit of self-defense. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I wouldn't say I was bullied at school exactly, but... I I didn't fit in very well when I was growing up and there was that bit of me that said, you know, I, I want to, I mean, looking back on it, I would, I would interpret that as, you know, I want to learn some physical presence. Okay. You know, I, I want to, to feel a bit more empowered. I, w- I wouldn't have put it like that at the time, uh, but it, there was that bit of me that wanted to learn how to fight. Right. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I started out with Taekwondo because there was a local club. They put some flyers through the door. Sure. Um, I did that for a bit and I instantly just really enjoyed doing it. And I think it was because it was something physical. It was, that was something that I hadn't really had up to that point. I'd never particularly got on with sport at school. I'd not been a particularly sporty kid. I didn't feel like I was particularly good at it. So mm-hmm. I hadn't, I hadn't really taken to it, but here was something that I could do that, I enjoyed doing again you know I wasn't particularly good at it I think my first taekwondo instructor years later he said that you know he saw me as a a sweet innocent kid who couldn't punch a way out of a wet paper bag (laughs) and that was very much sort of where I was at the time so but because I enjoyed it I, I really got into that and I sort of followed that through until I went to university 
at university, obviously, you've got the opportunity to do loads and loads of different things. Yeah, it's really and great. Lots of different martial arts. So yeah. I tried out a few different martial arts. Uh, I got interested in jiu-jitsu and the grappling element of jiu-jitsu, which is something that I hadn't done. And things sort of went from there, really, because a few years later... I was at a stage where I was sort of thinking, well, maybe I want to start teaching this. You know, I was at a, a level where that would have been appropriate. But having never really been in anything resembling a real fight, yeah, it's, I sort of felt, well, how can I be telling people how to defend yeah, themselves yeah, when yeah. I, I don't really know if this actually works? A rare level of integrity in martial arts. So, um, so I sort of started thinking, well, how, how do you go about getting experience? Because you can't just go around sort of starting street fights. I mean, there are people who sort of go and work the doors and do yeah. that in order to get experience. And that, I mean, that was a, I know there's, there's, a, there's a whole group of martial artists who sort of went down that route. Um, it didn't really feel like that was going to work for me, particularly, again, sort of being relatively small and female. It's, it, it, it was a little bit harder to, to go and get that experience directly. So that's when, about when I heard about some, um, mixed martial arts and at the time it was a really new sport it was something that had sort of just come over from the mm -hmm. united states mm -hmm. there was it was a very small niche within a within a niche if you like and i saw a documentary about it and i thought that's something that i want to have a go at and my plan was i'm just gonna have a couple of fights to prove to myself that i can do it and then i'll go and get on with the rest of my life um so that was that was my idea and then somewhere along the way i sort of got hooked on that and i oh, I'm doing all right here. I'm, I'm quite good at this. How good could I get? And not so many women at that time doing MMA as well. Was there, a, you, like now it's much more normal, but. Yes. Um, no, I mean, I was the, um, one of the first British women to be, be doing mixed martial arts. And I mean, this was at a time when uh, there was very little women's mixed martial arts anywhere. I mean, there's a bit in Japan, there's a bit in the US. Yeah. It was, it, it was rare. People were disturbed to see, you know, women in a cage punching each other in the face, right? They were, you know, that was, it was uncomfortable for many people to see, I think, at that, at that stage. Yes. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, I'm back then, I'm back, again, sort of thinking back, this was the time when people were trying to, to ban mixed martial arts. As yeah, ban in several states, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It was the uh, whole, oh, it's just human cockfighting. Um, yeah. And all of that rhetoric. So, again, for sort of women to be involved in it, it, it was seen as, um, uh, oh, this is something that women shouldn't be doing. Just tasteful um, somehow, you know. We're, we're, yes. Actually, yeah. I think it shows the sexism we have against men in a way. It's like, well, we'll let men hurt each other, but we don't want women to hurt each other. You yeah. know, like that, that's it's in the <laughs> way in which we're casual about violence towards men, I think that shows, as well as the sexism against women. Yes. I mean, as I say, it's either it's a legitimate sport, in which case there's, what's wrong with anyone doing it, or it's not. In which case... <laughs> Mentioned the river. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's one or the other, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I, th I mean, that was always a bit odd. But it, uh, sort of thinking about I mean, things have come a long way. I mean, nowadays, it's seen much more as a, a legitimate combat sport in the same way that... Incredibly technical. Incredibly yeah. technical, right? I mean, jiu-jitsu is like, like chess in that way, right? People always say, but I, I had no idea how technical it was till I did a little bit of jiu-jitsu. I was like, wow, this is really impressive how the level of skill involved, you know? And yes. how someone your size could e easily beat someone like me, like my size in jiu-jitsu, even though you're probably, what, are you, how many kilograms do you know? About 60. Okay, and I'm, I'm uh, what am I, 85, nearly 80. So, like, you're losing 20 kilograms to me, but you could easily choke me out in jiu-jitsu. Like, in a matter of seconds, you would just make me your bitch. And it's like, that shows the technical skill of jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah, so it's, I mean, I think, I mean, this is true of all sports, right? I think you see this in, in boxing or kickboxing as well, but I think with jiu-jitsu particularly, because if the difference... Everyone thinks they know how to throw a punch. Well, at least most men think they know how to throw a punch. <laughs> right. They might not be very good at it, but they've yeah. got an idea what it looks like. Yeah. I think when it comes to, to grappling and wrestling, unless you've done it at some level, you know, yeah. it's, um, it's very hard to know even where to start with it. And I think yeah. somebody who's done even a few months of jiu-jitsu against somebody who's not done anything. Yes. Um, after six months, I could reg I could repeatedly tap out and choke out all the new people in the club. Like on their, if it was their first night, even yeah. after six months, which is not lots in martial arts, it was like tap, 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 tap. 
you know, and I remember what that was like on the other side. <laughs> and, and people are routinely surprised by this as well. Yes. I mean, I remember when every time I ro- rolled with somebody who's sort of new to the sport, they look, I, I remember having one conversation with the guy who's sort of, he'd been having a tough time with some of the lads in the gym and, you know, he'd just come in. He thought he was reasonably tough. He'd done a bit of training with a mate in his garage and okay. so that he watched the UFC and sort of he wanted to get into fighting. And he was having a, a, a tough night because a bunch of guys who knew what they were doing. So he sort of looked around, looked for the smallest person in the room, and it happened to be me. And he came over and said, oh, do you want to roll? And uh, I said, okay, then. Um, And as soon as he started not getting all his own way, it it just went absolutely batshit. He went crazy, got angry. Yeah. Um, And just sort of... It, it, it was so sort of um, threatening for him to be in a position where you know, this small person who's... A small woman as well, right? You expect, to, yeah, you expect to uh, be able to dominate pretty easily and suddenly it's not happening. It's like, well, what's going on here? Uh, I think yeah. that's something that I, I noticed a lot with, uh, um, with male beginners coming to the sport is uh-huh. that sort of feeling of, oh God, um, this is not what I expected. I've had various teachers of martial arts that they actually prefer teaching women or girls because they um, learn quicker because they have less ego because it really takes a humility to be... Like, I remember going to classes and I keto black belt and thinking, OK, I'm not going to be good at this, but I might have some chance. And it was just like tap, 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 tap. You know, 20 taps out by the end of the night. Oh, my... And people were going easy on me. They're nice guys at the Brighton Club. Mm-hmm. They're a nice club. They're not bullies. And I was like... Oh my God. And then to go back next week, I really had to put my pride aside, you know? I think one thing is that women are less likely to think they can do it already. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to learn something if you think you're already good at it. And sometimes right. discovering that you're not good at something that you thought you were good at. Yes. That's a, di- that's a difficult thing. I think that's where the ego thing comes in. No. It's not that women have less ego in general. It's that they're less likely to have made that assumption that they can already do it. I'm, I'm trying to think what's the female equivalent of that, something that most women think they're great at, but actually are pretty average at. <laughs> oh, like, I'm sure there's lots of examples. I'm trying to yeah. think. I'm trying to think there's probably something out there. I find with guys, it's uh, fighting, marketing and driving. You know, like I'm always getting <laughs> marketing advice from guys. I'm like, really? I've really studied this stuff, mate. You know, but, uh, and I'm just, I just admit I'm a bad driver, but that's rare amongst men. <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of things that people assume that they can do without having had any background or training in it and mm. I mean, this is something that I, I, find, I mean again when when people talk about um mansplaining which i know is a, a trigger word for you um <laughs> I disagree with it i think it's sexist I, I, um, I th- no to be honest to be honest i think anyone can do it yeah um Maybe more I, I think it's it's when people assume that they know more about something without ever having studied it or ever having I'm an expert spent any time yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, and they'll start correcting somebody who's actually spent quite a lot of time doing that. Right, right. Um, yeah. And again, I, I think... I think give me business advice like this and I'd be like, yeah, Dad, yeah, yeah. Business. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a common phenomenon. Um, and, and I think it does often come from a good intent as well. That's the other thing I don't like about how it's normally presented. Like, my dad was genuinely trying to help me in my business with his crap business advice. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just a bit arrogant that he didn't really realise he'd never run a business and didn't know what he was doing. And watching the Dragon's Den a couple of times doesn't qualify you. Yeah. you know, so. I, I mean, I, th- I think dad splaining is a whole other thing. Itself. <laughs> That's um, another level. <laughs> yeah. Um, I th- we, we all get that. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so... I think I think you're right. I think it's it's often a lack of self awareness. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, g- going back to sort of men and fighting, I think that sort of basic assumption that I'm a man, I ought to be able to do this stuff. Um, a surprising number of people have that, and I've, I've talked to guys about this in in training or after training, um, and even sort of people who are not particularly macho, they don't particularly buy into mm-hmm. that um, mm-hmm. idea. But at the back of their head, somewhere is that assumption that sort of culture is, uh, um, you know, they, they've grown up with, that they're a man, they, they know how to do this. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, how, let's talk about gender a little bit in this then. So mm-hmm. MMA, not many women were doing it. You're one of the first British women, you know, 10 years ago, I think when we met, there was like one girl in the MMA club. I, I heard this whole, whole load, lots more mm-hmm. now in the same MMA club. Um, you know, did it confront gender stuff in terms of sexism or in terms of like your own sense of your own femininity or talk a little bit about that. I'm just, just interested in that. I think, I mean, <sighs> There's sexism everywhere, right? I think I got more sexism from the fans in general than from the people I trained with. Uh At least more. Uh Generally speaking, what I tend to find is that when you get to know people, they'll take you as they find you. Yes. And I think this is, I mean, this is one of the reasons that um, people who have a lot of, um, immigrants in their community generally have better feelings towards immigrants than people who don't because when you get to know people you get to realize that they're just people and yeah. you engage with them sort of on that human level i think when you look from the outside it's more the the idea of things that people sometimes don't like and i think what i tend to find is that it was the idea of women fighting that people didn't like right rather than the actual thing itself and i think when you when you train with people and they get used to the fact that you're just there and you know, you're just there to train the same way that they are and they see you doing the same things that they are. Yep. Yep. Those sort of differences, um, just don't become that relevant. Um, I think this is something about how we fight prejudice generally, actually, Mm -hmm. you know, I said to say, you know, John Barnes did more to end racism in Liverpool as the first black football player for Liverpool than, you know, many, many kind of, uh, we'd now call them like woke academics at Liverpool University ever fucking did. You know, like there's something about just participating and people getting to know people as people that seems yeah. to be a key thing. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And I think, I mean, the gay rights movement is another example of that because I think um, the... M- the more people sort of started to realise, well, you know what, actually I know somebody or, you know, um, one of my friends is, when people started sort of putting um, their wedding photos on Facebook and things like yeah, that, and yeah. everyone realised that actually this is just a normal human thing. Um, and, you know, people, it, it affects people who I know. I think all of a sudden, a lot of that prejudice became much less, uh, much less acceptable. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's that it's humanising things, and again, you know, one of the things I've found is that actually by training with guys, that's one of the best ways to to change attitudes. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Actual reality. You know, I've definitely yeah. gained a lot of respect from you know female martial arts teachers of mine. I'm like, okay, you know, something. Else. Say, fighting prejudice, one arm bar at a time. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And how does this affect like your intimate life, for example? If it's not too much, you know, decide what level of detail you're happy with being in public. But you know, it must be a strange thing to be able to be in bed with someone and be able to choke them out. You know, like in, it's is, like most are generally... men comfortable with that. <laughs> it's not something I'm, I'm particularly conscious of most of the time, you know, it's not something I'm not, it's not at the front of my mind. But, but what about, it might not be in front of your mind, but what about, you know, potentially <laughs> your friend, you're dating someone and they're like, they find out you can kick their ass. Now you might say that shouldn't make any difference, but I imagine it does to some. I guy. think it probably, it probably makes a difference to some. Um, yeah. Again, it's, it's an interesting filter, isn't it? Because people who. Okay. Can, yeah. Yeah. Are they insecure. People, that says something. People who are intimidated by, a former UFC fighter. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, maybe that's um, that sort of indicates something about that they're not secure in their own masculinity. I would say, and also, it's like, why would you be worried about a girlfriend that can defend herself? Like, that's, if you're not, if you're not, if you're not thinking you might quite like to attack her, surely that's a fairly strange thing to be worried about. In a way, this is it. I mean, again, sort of when it comes to. To dating and I've I've met a lot of women who complain that you know that when they they talk to me about what they do and the fact they've got quite high powered jobs or they're yeah, very educated yeah. that it puts men off. Yeah, and I always say, well, actually, that's a good thing, right? Yeah, who are the men you put off? It's it it's good to have filters. Uh huh. It's uh-huh. good to have it's good to have filters. It's you don't want to be all things to all people. You don't want to appeal to everyone. Yeah, is um, yeah. that's that's just tedious. You know, you, you want to make sh- you you want to um, find the people who you're going to get on 
well with, who, who, who are going to work with yes. you um, as quickly as possible. And if that means filtering out some people who aren't going to work with who you are, then actually that's a good thing. Right, right, yeah. For, and for me, it's like I want to be around strong, smart women. I always have, you know, there's yeah. female black belts on the uh, on the um, uh, conference. Uh, you know, Daniela, Christina, there's a whole bunch of them actually who are working for the conference. I like working with those women, and that I think says something about them and about me yeah. in terms of that. So, um, it is and I think this is it because people have. I mean, we make generalizations about what men want or what women want, but actually, there's lots of different people who all want different things. And it's about finding the people who want the same things that you want or right. who are going to, you know, you're going to have that compatibility with. So there are plenty of men out there who do like strong, smart women. Um, there are men who don't. Yeah. But actually, from my point of view, you know, that that doesn't bother me because I'm never going to be all things to all people. You know, I'm, I'm not everyone's cup of espresso. Um, <laughs> Definitely espresso, not tea. Uh, it's, it's small but strong. Okay. And, and, and that's fine. That's fine. You know, it's... If that's more the relational side, then last thing on this, how is it on the, just the personal side? Is Does it impact your sense of your own femininity, whatever that is to you? Like, how is it on the sort of inside, if that's the... We just talk about the relational side, but from the inside. It's interesting because I was thinking about this. I think it does affect how I see myself and how I see the world, but it's very hard to sort of put my finger on that because... It's something I've always had as an adult, really, because I got into martial arts as a child. You know, it's yeah. something that I've always done. Um, I think, if anything, it's the fact that physical confrontation doesn't really worry me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's not to say that I think that I can beat everyone up, because sure, you know, sure, there sure. are certainly people. But, but it's that, I mean, even if I get beaten up, it, it doesn't bother me that much because I've been there before. Um, it's it's just one of those things, and I think sort of being reasonably relaxed about physical confrontation probably makes a difference to how I deal with other kinds of conflict as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a psychological link there. I think if at the back of your mind you're worried about what's going to happen if something turns physical, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then that probably affects how you deal with that. So it's something that. I mean, people have sort of commented on a few times with me that actually you seem really confident and, you know, it, it can be almost, um, I mean, not necessarily intimidating, but um, it's a different reaction from the one they'd expect, you know, when, when they're talking to me about something. So um, I think that's that's interesting. And I think that probably does come from that, that experience, mm -hmm. sort of the, the way that I've present myself in the way that I am mm -hmm. probably has a lot to do with that experience as well. So let's segue here then. So in, in, into politics, right? So you're doing MMA, you take that as far as it will go. You go to the, you know, the really the very highest levels of that. You go, okay, this is my limit. Okay. You retire, you, you do some climbing stuff. I've just seen on your Wikipedia page as well. Um, you know, you're, you're uh, you know, happily an osteopath. I remember seeing you as you retired. I was like, okay, she's an osteopath now. That makes sense after doing martial arts. You know, you do a bit of healing arts. Okay, those two things have always gone together. Where did the politics come from? Because in the time that I've known you, that's kind of come in. So I, I joined um, the Green Party back in 2015. Um, I didn't, wasn't really particularly politically engaged. I didn't have any intentions of becoming a politician. But when I moved to Solihull, so the local Green Party got in touch and came around to say hi. And you know, I got to know a few of the people there. And the local party here is very strong. They've got um, a good sort of base of councillors on the, on the local council. Mm -hmm. um, and... Anyway, it turned out that uh, they were looking for, for candidates and they wanted people who were uh, both interested, but also sort of had the, had the skill set and, you know, we're, we're going to be able to, to do this. And at, at first, my, my reaction was, look, I haven't got time for this. I've got too many other things going on. And then sort of one thing led to another and I had some conversations and I was saying, you know what, let's give it a go. And I got elected. That was last year. Mm -hmm. um, again, I got sort of really involved in 
some aspect of that. Um, I, I was, I've become our health and adult social care spokesperson. Yeah, so again, that sort of led to a whole sort of new le- lot of things that I've, I've become interested in. Um, and so one thing led to another, really. Um, it's, I discovered that it was something that I really enjoyed doing, um, partly because I think it is that, I mean, politics is war by other means, right? Um, <laughs> well, it's, I want to make this connection with you, so I'm um, gonna, I'm gonna, I was going to go there. But, and, yeah. but also because when you can make a difference to somebody's life and you can point that and you go, oh, I did that. Um, or even if you can't, you know, you say, but you have a feeling that it, what you said influenced what happened, then that's, there's something really satisfying about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And without giving you too much of a soapbox, why, why the Greens? I mean, they're sort of, for those listening in the UK, we kind of have uh, the Conservative Party, who are the ruling uh, right-wing party. We have Labour, who were a left-wing party. I'm not quite sure what they are now. We have the Liberals, who are very confused as a third party. <laughs> and uh, actually, my friend Anna is a politician for them. So hello, Anna. Should, if you want to come on, give me a shout. And um, then we have the Greens, who have one seat in the uh, one MP in Parliament, which is my constituency, Central Brighton, Caroline Lucas, Casa, who I sometimes see in the coffee shop being interviewed. So a uh, very approachable, accessible person that people like. Um, so it's very much sort of a fourth party in some ways, a smaller party than many of the others. Um, what, what, what drew you to this? So when I first became interested in, in uh, looking for a political party to, jo- to join, I think my thinking is, I mean, the... The climate emergency is the biggest existential threat that humanity faces. Mm. And if we don't deal with that, then there's going to come a point when not much else is going to matter. So I wanted a party that was going to take that seriously and give it the, uh, the level of consideration that it deserves. I also have a passion for, for social issues and for... Um, looking at things like inequality and the impacts of inequality on society and on people's lives, so that. And sort of putting these two together, the the Greens seem to be the only party that were adequately making that case and making the case that we need to do things differently because if we carry on the way that we're going or if we're just tinkering around the edges, then uh, very soon we're going to end up in a situation where things are going to go from from bad to worse um so that's what sort of um made the greens appeal to me in the first place once again i think i was fortunate in the ending up in solihull where the greens do have a very strong local party and a very strong representative me anyway because solihull you know brighton obviously we're super liberal budget yeah yeah, yeah. So solihull, this is- that's like the american listeners it's sort of the midlands is like i don't know detroit or something right it's kind yeah, yeah. of I mean, Solihull's a very conservative area. You know, the, the two yeah. conservative MPs have five-figure majorities, so it's, um, it's not somewhere you would necessarily expect to find um, a, a strong green vote. Mm. But, I mean, one of the things is we, we've got some super talented people here who've worked really hard and who know how, um, know how elections work, they know how politics works, they know how to get results. And that matters. I think when you're doing politics, Mm -hmm. competence makes a real difference. It's all very well having um, great ideals and great ideas and, you know, great policies and principles. But unless you can actually get a mandate to act on them, unless you can uh, get people to vote for you, then you can't make a difference. And this is very similar to the MMA focus compared to, say, traditional martial arts. It's like reality-based, results-based, yeah. what works. You know, like, that, there's, you either vote it in or you're not. You either get the vote or you don't. Do you know what I mean? It's very practical, very results-orientated there. Yeah, and I think, for me, and one of the things that, and this sort of brings me on to my leadership bit with the Green Party, is one of the things that has frustrated me with our national party has been that we sort of present ourselves as a bit of a pressure group or a lifestyle movement sometimes, right. as opposed to a serious political party that's focused on gaining political power. And I think as a political party, that's what we, that's what we exist to do. You yeah, know, you're not green of, to the Green Party. That's it. There's lots of organisations out there. You know, you can go and join Friends of the Earth or XR or Greenpeace or any of those people, and they all do important work. 
but as a political party, we're the only people who can get Greens into positions of power. And, and green issues are often considered somehow the um, sort of the hobby of the elite. Yes. You know, like yeah. Brighton is not a serious place. It's full of, you know, middle class students and sort of posh people. Yeah, we, we, we have an image that the Green Party is full of white middle class vegans. Uh-huh. But, I mean, some of my best friends are white middle class vegans, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, They're not mine. So I, it's the vegan part that worries me. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, have, no, I have no issues with, with white middle class vegans. But if, as an electoral niche, it's going, always going to be limited. And all, I mean, the fact that you've been a cage fighter is like, it gives you immediate not wimpy status, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. There's an I immediate think, credibility to that. Like this person's not, maybe maybe many things, but they're not a wimp. I don't, I don't get people calling me a snowflake very often. <laughs> How have you dealt with the whole sort of woke resurgence of late then? Because it's like, I've not known you as a particularly politically correct person, yet you're on a, you know, your party, which is... Um, uh, I don't know, is it, would you say it was left-wing, the Green Party, or does it, like the Germans, I, is they're out in front? Yeah, no, I, I, th- I think, I mean, I think it's certainly fair to say that we're, we're left. Um, again, sort of what particular flavour of left is uh, a matter of uh, um, ongoing discussion within the party. Right, right. But, uh, but yeah, I, th- I think, um, and again, there's, there's sort of diff- different kinds of left, isn't there? There's economically left, you know, in favour of uh, addressing inequality and sort of redistributing. Mm-hmm policies mm-hmm. and things and then there's um sort of socially left in terms of um sort of when we're talking about things like um uh, i mean as you say sort of the, the woke movement well there's liberal versus authoritarian yeah. left that's the big one i can get on with liberal left and liberal right i can't get yeah. on with authoritarian and, i mean this is one of the big differences left. i see between the green party and labor as well is uh-huh. i think that we tend to be more liberal left as opposed to the okay. Labour being sort of a bit more authoritarian left and yeah, more yeah. in favour of uh, um, centralised state control as opposed to, I mean, the Greens' focus is always on localism and sort uh-huh. of community focus and encouraging communities to make decisions that are right for them. So I think it's, there's, there's a difference in philosophy there. But, I mean, in terms of the, um, the, the social movement, the way I see it is, it, I mean, it's all about leading with compassion. Mm-hmm. Right? It's... Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. treating people the way that you'd want to be treated. And if you start with that, then it's you're not too far wrong. It's, uh, for me, I mean, a lot of the issues we're talking about, I mean, we've got a big issue in the Green Party at the moment about trans rights. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, that came up in MMA as well, didn't it? There was that trans uh, MMA fight. I don't know if you followed that one. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, there, there's certainly as far as sort of the political angle goes, um, I mean, again, it comes down to, well, how would I want to be treated if I was a trans person? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I look around and I see a lot of the abuse that they get online and, you know, the fact that they're constantly uh, being expected to justify their existence and their, uh, you know, their right to use the bathroom. And it's like, well, you know, sure, we, we've got to do better than this. Yeah, I've never quite understood why that one's such a big issue for a lot of people, the bathroom one. But so I personally don't want anyone to use my bathroom, just just so you know. Um, whether they be male or female, I want my own bathroom at any you know, <laughs> any time. I don't want anyone else in there. That's that's my policy on bathrooms, okay? Uh, what about the MMA one then? Because there was this this big sort of uh, issue of a trans MMA fighter. Was it Fallon Fox? And uh, this is someone, you know, who is physically bigger than most opponents, different muscle mass, different bone mass, maybe. I don't know the ins and outs of it. You probably know it much better than me. So do you have any opinion on that? It's a slightly tricky one. Um, the IOC has guidelines for um, trans um, for trans women competing in women cat- women's category. And it's to do with the hormone levels, basically. Um, okay. And how long been on on hormones and they've had these guidelines in place for some time and trans athletes have been eligible to compete at Olympics for some time. Right. right. There's yet to be a medalist who's trans in, Uh in not like all of a sudden trans women, you know, trans women kind of cis women in the hundred meters or something like that. Yeah. So this idea that we've opened the floodgates and now trans women are going to be winning everything. Um, it just doesn't seem to be, be borne out by reality. Um, in terms of sort of the whole point of having gender classes in, in sport is about 
creating an even playing field. Mm. So it, it's all about inclusion, you know, because if we have, if we, if we break these into men and women, then we're allowing more people to compete. We're allowing more people to, um, to take part. And this is generally considered to be a good thing. Uh-huh. Now, Asking what an even playing field looks like starts to get a bit sticky because you have to say, I mean, not everyone is born with equal attributes. Right, we're going to break that down for ethnicities. Yeah, we're going to break it down. We break it down it. age as well, don't we? We have like masters for people over 50 yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, some people, people are going to have different genetics. So some people are never going to be 100 metre sprinters because of the genetics they were born with. Me and you, I think. Yeah. And I mean, some sports are, are a bit more forgiving of genetics than others. I mean, sprinting is particularly unforgiving of genetics. Right. Um, but the question, to, you know, to what extent can we say that trans women and women can compete on an even playing field? It's a really difficult philosophical question, right? Yeah. Um, and I think in terms of something like mixed martial arts and contact sports, uh, the, the jury is still out in terms of um, how... Um, how much you can say, you know, that that two people should be in the same category. Yeah, I've given you a pretty hard question here. And I honestly, I don't know. I haven't looked into yeah, I haven't um, I mean, researched what, it enough to have a strong opinion either way on this. What, what I will say is that each sport is different. Each sport needs to be treated on its own merit. So what's true in MMA may be different from what's true in athletics, may be different from what's true in, say, roller derby um, or, you know, squash or gymnastics so each sport is going to need to have a slightly different take on this and also it's something that should be decided by sports governing bodies and sports scientists it's not something that is it a, polit- it's a bit of political football isn't it do you know what this i mean this is it and the, the problem is that whenever we talk about trans rights this is the example that people come come up with that you know they, they start saying oh it's unfair if they're competing in sport and i said well actually a lot of the people who are saying this are the people who 10 years ago were telling me nobody cares about women's sport yeah, yeah. Um, and they have shown no interest in the other issues facing... W- <laughs> right. <laughs> all of a sudden, they all really sudden, care about female martial arts. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden, they really care about female athletes, but only in this one specific context. Seems a bit really dodgy. Trans women are involved. You know, and actually, the other way, though, I've seen people who had no interest in sports at all who yeah. have suddenly become very insistent on this as well. It, yeah, it exactly. seems to be more about their political views elsewhere yeah, than yeah. actually a sincere so, interest in the sport. This is it. And this is why I think that actually, you know, when we're talking about trans rights in general, the issue of professional sport is something that affects a small number of people and possibly needs to be addressed on... You need a sensitive, nuanced discussion about this. I'm not, not going to happen on the internet, Rosie. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The sensitive, yeah. nuanced discussions are pretty difficult. How do you deal with, I mean, I see you handle them very well. I mean, back to sort of MMA skills on the real world. Uh, just like got 10 minutes and worse to be able to cover some of that. Like, how do you deal with the abuse, the criticism, the arguments, this like being a politician in the internet age? How do you handle that? Because it's like, I've effectively become a politician with leading the embodiment conference, right? I'm, you know, the leader of a small town, basically. Mm. It's like a few hundred thousand people in the conference. So it's like, how do you manage that? Maybe give me some tips here. I've always respected your opinion. So what, what's, what's your secret, Rosie? Because you I, mean, I, w- I wish I had the answer to that because, I mean, there are, there are times when I'll find myself, you know, um, sort of muttering furiously. (laughs) 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 Bloody seriously. Um, But uh, I think it's about, it's about knowing why, knowing when to engage, knowing when to disengage and knowing which trench you want to die in. Um, Is this the hill I want to die on, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you've got to ask yourself, you know, is is this is this really the issue that I I want to make a stand on? And sometimes it is, right? I mean, again, I saw. I mean, trans rights seems to have become a big thing. This, I'd like I'd like us all to move on from that. I'd like us to accept that. Yes, this is just common sense. Let's move on. Um, but it seems that there's, you know, unfortunately there are people who disagree with that. So. For me, that is a hill I'm prepared to die on because I think it's something that... It's important to you. It affects real people. You know, I, I, I see the impact that this 
conversation is having on people I know and people who I, I see out there. And it make, I want to do something about that. Um, you know, standing up for sort of marginalised minorities is part of why I got into politics. Right, right. Well, I'm going to be teaching the trans people of Moscow in about four days' time. So oh, we'll let you know how that goes. It's a bit different out there. So uh, we'd usually, it's usually it's mostly lesbians and trans people, some gay men, but most lesbians and trans people that I work with out there. A bit different environment out there. You know, the standards yeah, yeah, are slightly yeah. different as to what counts as prejudice. You know, it's uh, yeah. in some ways it's made me a target of sort of woke people because it's, my standard for what's not okay is very much influenced by being in Russia where, mm. where do you know what I mean where it's like it's much more nuanced here whereas there it's like just please don't kill me kind of thing you know so it's, yeah. it's pretty yeah, rough yeah. out there but, yeah. uh, but ethnicity I mean do you uh, for people that are listening on the podcast people might not be able to see Rosie looks looks like you're not white I've actually never asked Rosie despite knowing you for 10 years what do you mind if I ask your ethnic background yeah so I'm, I'm mixed race my mum's Malaysian Chinese my dad's English Mixed yeah. race. Okay. Uh, is that on your agenda as a politician? Is that something you're interested in? Is it something that comes up and just not so relevant to you? I think, I mean, diversity is a big issue. I mean, diversity is a big issue in the Green Party at the moment because, again, we, have, we still do have that very white middle class image. And, you know, I'll sometimes, I've been to regional conferences where I've been the only non-white face in a room. And I think that's a problem. You know, that's a, a problem for, because we can talk about issues that affect minorities, but when we're not talking about them with people who are affected right. by it. Right. Um, it's, it can come across as incredibly patronising. So, <laughs> yes, think, yes, people speaking for other people. Sometimes yes, I saw this way yes. about stuff in Brighton, you know, it's like, who are you speaking for? Do you have any remit for that? Yes, so. yeah. So I, th- I think it's, it's a big issue. And I mean, I think at the moment, you know, there's a lot that's going on um, I mean, we've seen when it comes to, to COVID, for example, the disproportionate impact on, on people of colour. And I think a lot of that has to do with those structural aspects of discrimination that, and it ties in very closely with the, the um, socioeconomic inequality as well. So there's a whole stack of factors there. And I think it's something that we do need to look at. I mean, the, with the Black Lives Matter movement, it was surprising how many people came to me and said, oh, we don't have a racism problem in this country. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing in this case, it's an American thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's different from America, but I certainly wouldn't claim that. Yeah. And you know, I said, well, you know, have you, have you talked to any people of colour about this? We asked them um, if they've got... Yeah, I, I talked to a Brazilian um, friend of mine the other day, I said, look, I'm the, I, I wasn't sure. I said, do you get any issues around this? This is a Brazilian. I hadn't really thought about that angle on it. And he was like, well, yeah, let me tell you. I was like... "Yeah." I'll shut the fuck up now then. <laughs> right? it's like... yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think this is it. It's, it's a, another very common thing is, well, because I don't experience this, I don't see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, it's not happening. You know, the, the, what you see is all there is bias. Sure. And this, I think men and women have this. You know, you oh, don't yeah, see the sexism sure. men get, and I don't see the sexism women get. Just We just don't see it because I, yeah. I don't know what it's like to be a woman. You don't know what it's like to be a bloke. And it's easy to assume that it's not happening because you're not on that end of it. So I think that's something that, and again, this work representation is important because unless you've got people who are engaged with those communities and who um, have some idea of what that looks like, I think it's very easy for that to get missed by politicians. I mean, it's something that I talk about um, when I'm in the council that, you know, are we, addressing this from the point of view of um, the people we're talking about, you know, ha- have we talked to them about it or is this something that we've just put together? Right. Are we actually considering their point of view, listening to them? And we are seeing this phenomenon now though in politics of, you know, the conservative party, for example, seem to have a, a whole bunch of really very posh black and Asian members now mm-hmm. in terms of their MPs. And yeah. I go, okay, so you've replaced white posh people with brown posh people. Yeah. And again, it's that intersectional element, isn't it? When you're talking about, you, you've got, there's race, but there's also that socioeconomic background. There's also, you know, lots of other factors that play into that. So, yeah. and again, for me, diversity isn't just about what faces you've got, you know, in your, in your cabinet or on your leaflets or, you know, yeah. It's 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 something something more fundamental than that. It's about um, making sure that when you're having conversations, people are represented in those conversations. It's asking yourself, you know, whose voice isn't isn't in this. 
That's a nice thing. So I think, you know, for our conference, for example, that's really important for us to ask whose voice is not in this and just doing it by skin colour doesn't really work either. Do you no, know what I mean? There's no. Voices it's, and types of people that are say, very included. I mean, socioeconomic background is something that we don't talk nearly about. Invisible to most Americans. I've always said to my American diversity kind of, you know, people like, um, I won't name names, but there's some really good diversity speakers in the embodiment world actually now, but often the American ones don't get class. They don't get socioeconomics. They're doing everything yeah. else except that and that just seems yeah. such a vital one particularly yeah. in the uk where class is massive yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i think um, there's uh, there's different aspects of class as well you know there's there's how much you earn but there's also um sort of what your parents background was how you grew up you know education what time you have dinner is do you do, what kind of bread do you eat it's do yeah. you shop at tesco's or waitrose listen rosie unfortunately we're out of time you are a class act of any class i really i love and respect you it's great to see you again it's nice to catch up if nothing else um you know you've got a lot of good stuff here in terms of where can people find you on the internet if they want to find you so they can find me on twitter so i've got um two twitter accounts there's rosie sexton that's R O S I S E X T O N, and there's my um, political account. I try and keep my political stuff separate, uh, which is uh, Doctor Sexton Green, or one word. Um, and those, um, that's probably where I am most often at the moment. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, so you can look me up on there, um, and uh, by all means, drop me a message or say say hi. Great. So you can follow you on Twitter. They can look at your MMA videos if they want to want to look at that. They want sure dog. There's your MMA record. I'm just looking this up now. It's all there. And uh, yeah, again, involved with green politics, maybe uh, where you are. I, I think you'll be future prime minister. I'm um, looking forward <laughs> to you to be. I'm looking forward to a death match between you and Putin, who is a six degree uh, black belt in judo, apparently. So I'm, I'm looking for uh, President Rosie being pitted against Vladimir Putin in a political death match for the future of politics between Russia, Russia and the UK. And me, me, and all my Russian, me and all my Russian trans friends can turn up and watch. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. That's what I'm looking forward to. So a uh, closing message about the body, Rosie, before we finish here. Any closing message about the body or about politics, about gender, diversity, anything you like? Ooh, ooh. Um, This is one of those where I'll I'll go away and I'll I'll think about what I should have said after I I haven't said it. Um, I think one of the themes in my life is is just is having the uh, being naive enough to start something and then stubborn enough to follow through. I think that's a, a good way to live. Oh, that's nice. Say that again. Naive enough to naive, start. Naive, naive enough to start and then stubborn enough to follow through. Boom. Boom. I mean, <laughs> given how successful you've been in other fields, Prime Minister Rosie, remember me when you're famous. I'll have tea at number 10. This is going to be great. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today, Rosie. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, Yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. This comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy 
And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. OK, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.